If so, what are God's traits? For my entire sentient life, I've been, well, a bit obsessed. But I'm in constant fear of fooling myself, allowing hope to crowd out reason. That's why, in searching for God, I've skewed heavily to thought, not experience, though religious believers tell me that is precisely my problem. But I can do only what works for me, protects me from fooling myself. And that's why I pursue analytic theology, which applies philosophical analysis to traditional theology, assessing stories about God by applying critical reasoning. But can I rely on analytic theology in searching for God? I'm concerned because analytic theology is controversial, even among believers who often privilege other kinds of knowledge especially biblical studies and biblical exegesis. That's why, because analytic theology might increase my confidence that God could make sense, I seek its challenges. What are the challenges to analytic theology? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I hear of a new institute that focuses on analytic theology, the Logos Institute for Analytic and Exegetical Theology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. They're holding a workshop on analytic theology. Attendees are mostly philosophers of religion, all believe in God, including the leading proponents and some critics of analytic theology. Here's my question to these philosopher believers. Would subjecting theology to analytic methods be better for believers clarifying theology? Or would analytic methods be worse for believers undermining theology? I begin with the founder and director of the Logos Institute, the professor of systematic theology at St. Andrews, Alan Torrance. Alan, tell me about the Institute, why analytic theology has become kind of a new buzzword in understanding theology and the Bible. Oliver Crisp and Michael Ray um, launched this ostensibly new approach to the theological task. Their concern was to try and emulate the methodological and epistemological ideals we see exemplified in analytic philosophy, namely lucidity, pellucidity, transparency, accountability, um, tight logical form, and engagement with arguments in a way that invites critique. Too often, we've tended to polarize into groups of theologians mm -hmm. who look to historical figures as their authorities. Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Schramm, Acher, Barth. And so it's very easy for us to find ourselves living in an echo chamber. What analytic theology is seeking to do is address the truth question. What are some examples of this where we have, uh, in theology itself, divisions between different camps of thinking, and then how can analytic theology uh, reflect on a, a different perspective on attacking that issue? Well, one example would be that the tradition has long held to, say, divine simplicity. God has no parts. And this is conciliar for ca Catholics. But Christian tradition generally has held to that. But we've been far too slow to ask what exactly we mean by that. Yeah. Because, for example, Thomists, who affirm divine simplicity, um, mean by it something very different from people in other Christian traditions. And so what analytic theologians do is saying, what exactly do we mean by simplicity? So one of the things that's become really clear in the last few years is a certain definition of simplicity um, implies and property collapse. All of those attributes are identical with each other. It means that when I say that God is loving, or God is all-powerful, and God is omniscient, I mean exactly the same thing. Yeah. So it could pull the rug out from under the whole business of Christian God talk. You're marrying this analytic theology with more traditional exegetical theology, and they seem to fight. Are you uh, mixing things that are uh, immiscible? We tend to divide up into Biblical scholars, systematic theologians, 
and biblical exegetes. Oh. And one of the tragedies, I think, has been the failure of those three groups to speak to each other. And so the key aim of the Logos Institute was to bring experts in those three fields together. Now, why, therefore, bring in biblical scholars? Very simple. Analytic theology isn't necessarily Christian. You could have Jewish analytic theology or Muslim analytic theology. The Logos Institute is an institute for Christian analytic theology. Obviously, at the heart of the Christian faith is the Bible. And so if the Bible is pertinent to how we think about God and God's purposes for humanity, then it's absolutely imperative that that come in, in, into mm. play. Mm. Otherwise, analytic theology will end up simply being a low-grade philosophy of religion. <laughs> okay, so now you've given me actually four different categories. We, we're starting with my interest in analytic theology and we, we know the exegetical uh, biblical experts. Now you're talking about biblical scholars and systematic theologians. So I just want you to give me a quick way that these four things cool. articulate together. Well, systematic theology um, and analytic theology are not opposed. In fact, analytic theology is the way to do systematic theology. It's asking the same questions, but just ensuring that we hold to certain key Methodological so, so, so and in that principles. sense, uh, uh, analytic theology is a method methodological concept, where systematic theology is a content-related concept. Can you differentiate them that way? It's not quite as clear as that. The vast majority of philosophy departments in the world are analytic. Right. That's what we want to see in, th in systematic theology. Right. right. And so. Um, I'd like to put myself out of a job one day. And <laughs> I'm chair of systematic theology. I would like the systematic to be dropped. Right. We'll still be doing things systematically but pursuing all the ideals, um, or hopefully exemplifying those ideals that we see in analytic philosophy. In analytic theology, we are looking at, at those loci that have mm, characterized yes, systematic yeah, theology, yeah, yeah, yeah. theology yeah. Right, um, right, theological right. anthropology, right, right. doctrine of the Trinity, um, Christology, right, soteriology, right. pneumatology, and so right. on. Now so, bring in the two biblical aspects, the biblical exegetes and the, and the biblical scholars. Exegetical theology is simply seeking to engage in God talk, Right, in and through a process of serious, rigorous, academic engagement with texts on the grounds that those texts mediate knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Now, to do that well, we need to have the archaeologists involved. We need to have um, the literary experts. We mm -hmm. need to understand the genres inv involved in, in the Bible mm -hmm. and so on. What the Logos Institute is seeking to do is to bring the exegetes, Christian philosophers, analytic philosophers, and the systematic theologians to the table to ask the fundamental questions at the heart of the Christian faith. Alan stresses the truth question as the core motivator for analytic theology. I like that, that's why I'm here. He lays out the fundamental challenge to analytic theology, how it articulates with traditional theology and biblical studies. To me, this is crucial. The difference between playing intellectual games with philosophical puzzles and seeking real insights about ultimate truth. To grasp where I am, I consider four ways of thinking about the God of the Bible. Analytic theology is a methodology for applying analytic philosophy to theological topics. Systematic theology classifies and explains biblical doctrines assembling and deriving theological topics. Biblical exegesis studies words and meanings of biblical texts in their original languages and cultural environments. Biblical studies examines origins, authors, and interpretations of biblical manuscripts in their historical contexts. To test whether analytic theology can carry the weight, I try to probe the relationship between analytic and systematic theology and biblical exegesis and studies. I seek the research professor of New Testament and early Christianity at St. Andrews, the retired distinguished Anglican bishop, N.T. Tom Wright. I think one of the things that biblical exegetes have always been suspicious about when looking at systematic theologians is the decline of narrative. And simply to say narrative theology isn't quite enough. You have to say maybe there is something about the way that the Jewish people told the story of the world, of Israel, etc., um, which the early Christians were plugging into, which scoops up those abstract ideas and does something different with them. And that if you try to take the abstract ideas out again, then you're boiling off too much. This text 
text has its own integrity. Mm -hmm. And if you simply go looking for the proof text, as it were, yeah. then you are not respecting that integrity. And of course, the question of biblical authority is itself a major theological topic. Okay. But it's possible, and some theologians have done this, to write books about biblical theology or biblical authority with minimal attention to what the Bible itself is actually saying about itself, but about God and Jesus and the world. Mm. So it seems to me that this dialogue has to happen because you know, the ideas ought to make sense. And it's one of the criticisms of Christianity and of the Bible for the last two or three hundred years at least, that, oh, well, the Bible's just full of these odd stories that they don't make sense. And so the biblical scholar wants to say, actually, they do make sense, but what counts as making sense? And I would say it's something to do with this larger story of God and the world, of God and Israel, of God, Israel, and all the problems that they run into, the Old Testament full of exile and, and slavery and so on. And then how is the New Testament resolving that. It's not resolving a set of abstract questions about um, God and evil and humans. It's resolving a narrative about God and Israel and the world. And once you say that, all sorts of things look very different. If I were now sitting in the seat of a systematic theologian, I would say that when I look at the Bible, some of these stories or approaches seem to contradict each other. And if I believe it, I have to come up with some different kind of overarching framework to see how these parent contradictions yeah, yeah. can articulate and be coherent. I think that's right, and I think you see that already in the first two chapters of Genesis. Of course, some people, especially I think in America, tend to say you either take it literally or you don't believe it at all. Mm -hmm. But if you take Genesis 1, and then take Genesis yes, 2, you have two very different yes, accounts right. of creation. And I see those two as rather like the first half and the second half of a verse in the Psalms, where in my tradition, at least, when you recite the Psalms, you often pause in the middle, mm -hmm. and the pause in the middle is the moment when you allow the two similar but different mm. things to resonate with one another. Uh, a manuscript crit critic would say Genesis 1 and 2 came from different traditions, from different writers, then it was redacted together, and what you're trying to do is to make some grand harmony out of something that was just put together by some people out of different sources. That's actually a problem which I think is more apparent than real. What you're looking at is the life of a community, namely the, the ancient Israelite people, the Jewish people, and these are the stories that these people yeah, yeah. tell themselves about who they are, and they don't seem to be bothered by the fact that maybe um, this one is looking in this way and that one's more emphasizing that, because actually human stories are not little test tubes into which everything has to work in the same way. When you translate it up again into the idea of a big story, it gives you a world like an enormous building where there's room to explore and different things going on in different rooms, but the house sort of works as a house. Of course you could say, didn't they realize that that just came from a tradition which was determinedly saying such and such. And that's when I think a, the a theologian might well want to say, well, do you have a belief in providence? Do you believe that there is a God who actually wanted you to have something more or less like this text? If you have some kind of a belief in an overarching providence within which the narrative might make sense, then living with this book, not as a set of abstract propositions, but as the narrative of the life of a people, which ends by the way, with a big question mark. The Old Testament ends sure. with sort of, so what? What's going to happen next? And the New Testament is written to give some interestingly different but converging answers to that so what question. So it seems to me that this dialogue has to... Tom explains how story and narrative are mediums to express ultimate truth. God is not obliged to speak with the formal logic of analytic philosophers or within the demarcated categories of systematic theologians. But how do story and narrative express ultimate truth? And how do they articulate with analytic theology? I speak with a past president of the Society of Christian Philosophers to whom story and narrative are the religious core, Eleanor Stump. See, here's a question to ask first. What's the difference between theology and philosophy? The old answer went something like this. Philosophy is just abstract and impartial reason done from a starting point of nowhere. Whereas theology starts with what it takes to be divinely revealed texts and authorities. So obviously 
theology is intellectually inferior, it doesn't use this wonderful impartial reason. <laughs> but this now strikes most people as funny. The thought that what philosophers do is operate with impartial reason operating from the position of nowhere is either ridiculous or infuriating, depending on where mm -hmm. you are in the cultural wars of the time. If that's not the difference between philosophy and theology, what is it? I mean, it's clearly not the difference. Philosophy operates within a culture. It's got its own authorities to which it defers. It's got its own accepted texts, which you have to have some acquaintance with. And I think the difference is shown in the names. So what is philosophy? It's the love of wisdom. Now notice that wisdom is an abstract universal. It doesn't have a face. It can't call to you. It can't scold you can't punish you. That's philosophy for you. Mm -hmm. It operates by looking for wisdom. It starts with distinctions of abstract terms, looks for universal generalizations, and so on. So what is theology? Okay, think about it. It's a logos, a formula, reasoned reflection, a word about theos, about God. And God is paradigmatically a particular something with a mind and a will. And this is a thesis that even proponents of classical theism will accept. God has a mind and a will. God can call you in a way wisdom can't. There's a difference. And this difference makes all the difference in the world to how you proceed. You can give abstract, reasoned arguments for universal conclusions, but they won't give you much insight into a particular person. And if you want to understand a particular person, you're going to need a story. So it's a very different methodology as well as different subject matter between the two. Here's the problem. Philosophy in its seeking after wisdom can have a kind of hemianopia, blindness to half the visual field, mm -hmm. because a lot of what philosophy is trying to understand is in fact persons. And, and you can't just go after wisdom and get things about persons right. So if you look at the way philosophers sometimes reason, we want to ask where they've been all their lives. I mean, people don't work like that. Life doesn't work like that, you know. It seems that philosophy, when it's at its worst, can be sterile and jejune. But by the same token, theology can really benefit from making distinctions, careful reasoning, mm. thoughtful examination of universal generalizations. If all you've got is particular stories about particular persons, you can get so muddied, so fuzzy in your thinking, you're not any help in understanding the deep things of our lives. Meld these two. Meld that culture-long, generation-long, experienced understanding through narrative with philosophy's search after wisdom. And you get something of real power for helping us understand ourselves and the world we live in. Is this how analytic theology is supposed to work? The biblical God, if there is a biblical God, communicates via human story and narrative. Then, studying these stories and narratives, biblical exegetes and scholars construct biblical doctrines. And then, analyzing those biblical doctrines, analytic philosophers with theistic beliefs refine and polish those doctrines. If this is the process, then analytic theology is not overburdened to carry more than it can bear. Analytic theology cannot prove that God exists or that the Bible is God's revelation, and it shouldn't even try. Rather, at its best, analytic theology is a refiner of biblical doctrines, polishing doctrinal gems, as it were, to sparkle with internal consistency. Analytic theology can never, by itself, take me to belief, because belief is already packed into its founding assumptions. Is analytic theology then circular? It depends on its mission. To discern analytic theology's mission, I should explore its historical context. I ask a theistic philosopher who helped develop analytic theology, Michael Murray. So in the 18th century, you have the Scottish philosopher David Hume and the German-Prussian philosopher Immanuel Kant, um, who made some pretty stark and far-reaching claims about the limits of human reason. Right. What they argued was that the sort of reasoning that human beings are capable of engaging in simply can't tell us about 
the world beyond our experience. It can't really tell us about the nature of the material world, and it certainly can't tell us about the nature of spiritual reality. Much of Western theology latched on to the arguments of Hume and Kant and made them sort of central planks in how they went forward in their kind of theological theorizing. However, philosophers weren't as willing to accept unquestioningly the conclusions that Hume and Kant drew. And in the late 20th century, when philosophy of religion began to experience something of a revival, the philosophers went back and re-examined these claims of Hume and Kant and began having conversations with their theological peers saying, you know, you guys have taken these arguments as um, conclusive, and in fact, they're not. And if we set aside the arguments of human Kant, it might give us some license to return to ways of doing theology that were predominant before human Kant um, that can take advantage of philosophical types of reasoning and perhaps allow us to make some progress in theological understanding. So what's an example of where you, you might have been constrained by the, the tradition of human Kant prior that analytic theology can open up to allow you to uh, address issues. Many of the topics actually that are central for your interest and in closer to truth would mm -hmm. be examples. Mm -hmm. So uh, reasoning to uh, the nature and existence of God from empirical data, that would include things like arguing that there must be a first cause for the universe, something that Kant claimed we couldn't yeah, do, right, right. or claiming that there's a designer because we see evidence of fine-tuning in the cosmos. Can you differentiate what analytic theology would do from what philosophy of religion has been doing? So I think one thing that those who have aimed to launch this movement of analytic theology wanted to do was not just to get theologians to engage with contemporary philosophy of religion, but vice versa. That is to have the, the philosophers sit down and take serious oh. accounting of mm. what's happening in contemporary mm. theology. So they're trying to better understand the presuppositions behind biblical interpretation and biblical theology, but also to look at some of the figures that have been classical figures since the time of human Kant and try to understand what their, the philosophical mm. presuppositions of those views are. Let me tell you two kinds of objections that I've heard. Uh, number one is that theology is not just propositions. Uh, systematic theology is not the Bible, but the Bible are stories, are metaphors, emotions, are subtleties, the way God communicates. And if you try to reduce that to the propositions of formal logic, you're going to uh, come up with some answers, but you're going to eviscerate the whole point. I agree with you. That's part of what's been contentious. So on the one hand, what the philosophers of religion have been concerned about is that uh, much of what's gone on in theology has been so reliant on metaphor and analogy and non-literal use of terms and absence of reasoning in accordance with the canons of formal logic that it's become unclear what theologians are actually trying to affirm. That's on the one extreme. On the other extreme, some theologians have been arguing that there are things that we can capture through story, metaphor, and analogy that may not be as amenable to the kind of logic chopping that philosophers mm. are comfortable mm. with. I think what the philosophers who've really committed them themselves to analytic theology are trying to grapple with is how do we extract lessons from metaphor, analogy, and story that can be genuinely meaningful about our understanding of ourselves and God in a way that's also rigorous. That is, it doesn't uh, run up against the canons of logic. Another group are the um, biblical exegetes who say that you're doing formal logic and what you really need to do is really delve into the biblical text. You're coming up with some doctrines to discuss. Those doctrines are based upon the, the Holy Bible, <laughs> as I see here. But then the philosophers, they, they never look at it again. So theology is a negotiation between the data that comes from sacred texts and, and, and human reason. And you know, some complain that the, the quote unquote God of the philosophers, the God of Anselm and Aquinas and so on, just seems unrecognizable when you open the pages of scripture. And I think philosophers have begun to take that seriously. On the other hand, the Bible scholars who simply want to look at the text and how it was understood at that particular juncture in time and what the author intended mm -hmm. to convey, mm -hmm. sometimes they're also missing something. So what they're missing, first of all, is that the biblical text is a narrative that consists of many, many, many books. And one thing we need to do is to try to come up with a coherent synthetic account of the God that's described in those passages and other doctrines as well, doctrines of soul and afterlife and so on. So there's this negotiation between, on the one hand, the biblical data, which we always need to come back to and understand, and the canons of reason, which we use to try to make sense of those doctrines. Analytic theology is no shortcut to God. It makes no such claims. Rather, it seeks harmony between the God of Revelation and the God of the philosophers. 
How does analytic theology work with Bible-based methods and scholarship? With systematic theology, analytic theology provides rigorous and transparent thinking. With biblical exegesis and with biblical studies, analytic theology receives biblical doctrines on which to work. What about the reverse? Can analytic theology guide biblical exegesis and studies? Advise which doctrines make sense and which do not? Yes, but only with care because knowledge may not be complete. Although analytic theology emerges in a Christian context, how it approaches questions and dissects issues resonate with Jewish and Islamic analytic theology. Appreciating analytic theology, limitations as well as capabilities, brings us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.